This is the cover of my book, which represents a lot of flying memories over the years. If you've been a bush pilot, you probably have a data bank full of memories very similar to mine. And uh, for 7,800 hours and twin otters, this was sort of my window to the world. And that and it was an enjoyable time. I primarily covered the central areas of Canada. So Manitoba, Saskatchewan, some Alberta, the Arctic areas, Ontario, and that. So covered a lot of it. I didn't do very much in BC, a little bit in the Yukon and only bits and pieces in Quebec. So primarily central Canada. This was the first airplane I got paid to fly. And it was a different experience. This was kind of a fun airplane. And mostly what I did was take tours up for scenic flights and, and light charter work. So that wasn't too bad. And that was kind of easy work and, and stuff. And after a bit, I flew the 185. It was painted similar to this one, but this one was when I was with Bomber. And, uh, so I worked out of Trout Lake in North Bay, Ontario, and that's the lake there. The lake is 600 feet below the airport elevation, but it was, it was in the control tower zone. So the control tower would shut down if the weather got bad, but we still might have 500 feet of ceiling and 10 or 15 miles visibility. So our boss said, you go and take a try. But we couldn't contact the tower until we were airborne. So if you were airborne and called them, they would turn, tell you to turn around and land. So that didn't get you any money and, and didn't get the job done. So we had a routine where we would fly down the lake at about 20 feet off the water. About where the center goes, you can see a little bit of a hook there. And, that, and there was a river at the end. And if you flew down the lake low, keep low radar coverage, go down the river between the trees. When you get to a certain point, you were outside the control zone. So then you could climb and, and carry on and, and complete your trip for the most part. Uh, one day, there was three of us lined up to take off and, and all one right after the other, flying down there towards the river and turn down, going between the trees down the river. And it's what I call my brief moment of the Battle of Britain. As all three of us, one right after the other, went down the river, there was a beaver coming the other direction between the trees down the river. And all of a sudden, everybody was peeling every different which way over to the trees. Nobody got shot down or anything, and, but it was a scary incident when it was so close to everybody. I did a number of trips to Belterre, Quebec out of uh, Trout Lake and different incidents happened. One of my first trips there, I took a couple of guys up there, nice day, a little breezy, but not bad. And that landed, deplaned the passengers and then taxied out to go. So just as I pushed the throttle in and the airplane was just about to come up on the step, I ended up pretty well smashed against the back seat of the airplane. And uh, my seat had let go on the rail and, and it was all I could do hanging on the throttle to pull it back and the yoke to pull myself up enough to abort the takeoff. And I kept trying to think, you know, what does this look like to anybody watching on the dock or that eventually I got it repositioned and took off leaning very far forward so the seat wouldn't go back. And when I got back, apparently there was a little safety locking pin that fits in the rail to prevent the seat from going back that somebody had removed and not replaced. So that was the first instance. Later on in the season, during moose season, three of us went up there and we landed there about two days before the season opened. And when you tied up to the dock, there was a long line of cars down the road. And 
we looked at it and the guy came to us and said, okay, here you go. Here's some maps of the area. And we have sort of rough campsites marked. Try not to put hunters on the same lake. There's a lot of different little lakes around. So, okay, that'll work. And so we got through the first day, okay, and not a problem. So that evening, people would come in while we were in the hotel restaurant area and they'd try and bribe us by buying us steaks or whatever. No, that didn't work. And most of they only spoke French for the most part. And we only spoke English, so never did figure it out. But it didn't matter anyway, because we didn't have any authority over who went when. So next morning we get out there, it's all fogged in. Nobody can go anywhere. Okay, well, we'll all sit around and gradually the fog dissipates as the sun starts to warm it up a little bit. And it gets good enough that, okay, you can see the lake where we are. And, okay, we'll go try it. It's pretty hilly around there, but it looks okay. So we take off and I took off. And, and the lake I had to go to wasn't too far away, but I was up over the hills and going in. And, and then I got back there was a lot of ground fog around again. And I, there was an open bay in the lake and it looked exactly like the one I had on my map. Okay, I'll go down, go down, get down over the trees and just land on the lake. And all of a sudden it's not the lake that I was supposed to go to. It's a lot shorter and it's kind of shaped like a Z. So I got no real long length, but I got sort of a jog and dipsy doodle in it. And that. But I got two big hunters, all their gear, and a canoe strapped on the outside. And I'm sitting there, well, okay, this is the wrong lake. The, the fog is slowly burning off. And, and that, well, I got to go find the right lake. So I go back as close to the shoreline as I can, can get on the longest length of the lake and fly power to take off, get going, get up on the step start going along a little, ease back on the controls, but then the spreader bar at the back goes under the water and the aircraft slows down a bit. I push the yoke forward again, pick up speed, and I'm just about to abort the takeoff because the shore is getting pretty close. And that, when the airplane gets airborne, oh, okay, now I'm thinking, what do I do? This is not a really a good, comfortable situation. Gradually ease the nose up a little with full power on the stall warning horns blaring away and, and then the trees are getting closer and, and that we managed to get up just over the branches of the trees. But then I had a half mile up a hillside to go. So even a half mile after I climbing out, I'm still only about 20 to 30 feet over the treetops with the stall warning horn blaring. But then once I got up to that point, the hills crested and went down the other side. So I was okay. And the one hunter beside me, he let out a great big woo. And I kind of agreed with him wholeheartedly. We did find the lake and then it was back. The rest of the day was pretty well normal. Except later on in the day, I had another trip, went into a lake and, and you fly over the lakes and you get an idea what good campsite or not when party I had landed on the lake and was going along and, and the one fella he's pointing at one place where he wants to stop and say this is a great spot okay it didn't look too good to me but he's paying away so I stopped there and, and there's a rock and he steps out and it looks like a nice grassy shoreline and he takes two steps to the side and all of a sudden he's thigh deep in water and uh, so Oh, he realizes not such a good spot. So he gets back in and we go and find a spot to drop him off and, and that. I do another trip into another lake and the guys there, I'm just taking a few supplies into them. They'd set up camp the day before. Well, then they asked me if I'd like a moose steak for dinner. The season hadn't even opened yet, but I guess they figured the game warden wasn't going to be around. So that was okay. Didn't matter to me. I didn't bother stopping long anyway, so it was okay. So that was my experience as the first year, uh, learning to tie canoes on a float plane, 
Uh, the first one I crocheted on, and then one weekend I had to haul 34 of them, so I got a lot better at it by the end of that. About a year and a half later, two years, I was looking for another job, and there was a small ad in Canadian Aviation Magazine, uh, maybe an inch and a half by three quarters of an inch, just that pilot wanted and gave a little contact address and send do so. So I applied. I had about zero chance, I figured, of ever getting a response from it or that. But a short while later, a pilot from Air Canada phoned me and, and invited me to meet him at Toronto Island Airport. And he would look at showing me the airplane and, and giving me a checkout. And if I could handle it, then uh, I would get to meet the owner of the airplane after. Okay, fine. I went, we met up, went across and that, and the airplane on the slide is the one that uh, I got checked out on. It was a great airplane to fly. It had total time of 440 hours on it. And it was kind of a luxury interior, not a bush interior in it. So this was okay. I didn't know who owned it or anything at the time. And he said, after, okay, the checkout went well. So he said, you have to meet the owner. He's on the 21st penthouse floor of some big apartment down in Toronto. Okay. It's a little bit out of my zone where I reside and that, but that's fine. I meet up with him and his name was Gordon Secord. And at the time he owned a premier insurance company that was a registered owner of the airplane, but he was the CEO of the company. But he was basically retired. He was 74 years old at the time. And that, and he and I sort of hit it off really great. And that, well, that's fine. So I got the job and it paid a salary and, and he just peeled off some bills from his wallet and said, here's a, an advance if you need any expenses and, and that, so, okay. So a few days later, he says, we go and, and it was kind of the job you'd love to have in retirement. It was like a luxury job. He says, go to my cottage. He had a cottage on the lake north of North Bay, about 65 miles. And that, and it was the only one on the lake. So he says, I need to do some shopping before we go. So, okay, meet him. He had a brand new Cadillac. And in between when I wasn't flying, I used to chauffeur him around in his Cadillac. It was a white Cadillac convertible and that. So it was a little different than my old beater. But we drove down to a Loblaws store and, and parked. And, and he says, we're going around inside the store and he's throwing stuff in the car. He says, go in whenever you feel like and, and want. And I didn't, mostly I just let him do it, but we filled six shopping carts full of stuff. You know, you get in line at the cash register and the manager comes up and asks him, are you sure you can pay for all this stuff? Well, I thought he, he was going to be having a heart attack. He looked at the fella and said, I can probably buy the store and fire you right now. And, uh, and I thought, well, this is looking like a pretty good job right now. So we go back, load up the car and everything and haul the stuff down towards the airport. And, and out to the airplane to get ready for the next day's departure. And, and I said to him, you know, I don't really feel comfortable leaving my car in the parking lot in Toronto at the Island Airport for a week while we're away flying. I said, I'll come back. There won't be anything left in my car. He said, oh, don't worry. He go, we go over to the island and, and that, and I'm fussing around the airplane a bit and he disappears. And he comes back and he says, here's a pass. You can take your car across on the ferry boat to the island and park it beside the hangar. Oh, well, this works great for me. You know, that's a big comforting feeling. I don't have to worry about my vehicle disappearing. I get back on the other side and I talk to a couple of fellows on the ferry going back across and they say, you know, people who worked here 20 years can't get a pass to get across on the ferry. And uh, so he's a pretty influential guy. 
And I later found out he'd been CEO and chairman of 21 corporations. He'd been a grunt in World War I, a general in World War II with 3,000 men under him. And he could remember all their names. And that, but uh, for a multimillionaire, he was super easy for me to get along with, and he treated me very well. So, this is a picture. We used to fly into a private preserve in Quebec to go fishing, uh, and that was his outing while we would be away. There was a resort there, and, and they'd have a boat. And we'd get a boat and I'd just take them out fishing for the day and we'd stop and cook up some walleye for shore lunch or something. So good deal. And that, unfortunately, he passed away before I got a chance to do another season with him. And that, but it was a fun job and, and I enjoyed it. And, and I think we got along super well. So after that, when he died, the airplane was sold. And it was sold to a company at... Buttonville Airport. And I had sort of got out of aviation for a little bit. And I got a phone call one day and asked me if I'd be interested in flying the airplane again. Okay. They said they had a contract for it to go up to the Melville Peninsula in the Arctic and work with the Exploration crew doing uranium exploration in a Bell 206 helicopter. Okay, and that's fine. And I go and get checked out in the airplane again, fly it around a little myself. And then it comes time, well, it's still mid June or that, and you can't get up to the Melville Peninsula. It's still all ice covered on all the lakes. So they say, okay, well, we'll go start in northern Saskatchewan. All right. So take the airplane up there. And this was my home for a few months that summer. This was taken in northern Saskatchewan because there's trees and, and that. But basically, mud floor, dirt floor, whatever it is, depending on the weather conditions and pretty basic. I think we had about five of these tents that we would set up between all of us that were there and that. So heading up, we headed up to Repulse Bay and the Melville Peninsula area towards the end of July. I think it was the last week of July. And there's still ice on lakes and stuff. So probably a lot of lakes, 90% ice covered, smaller lakes, some of them were open. And that, but basically that was when we started our main level of work. So it went to Repulse Bay and they'd been in contact, the people that were managing the contract and the people at Repulse Bay had built a little dock on the saltwater lake beside the community. And that's where I would operate in and out of for hauling supplies and picking up fuel. To set up our main camp, we went 135 miles north of Repulse Bay on the Barrow River. And that, and it was okay, it was ice free because there was enough current and there was a sort of widening in the river where I could get in and out no problem at all and, and stuff. And, and there was an old abandoned camp there that we sort of set up our camp there. So we had some two by fours and wood that had been left around and bits and pieces and stuff. So we used that to build a, some elaborate benches and a few things around our camp. And, and, but uh, what you see in the picture is what the weather's like a lot of times uh, early in the season or at that time and during cold periods, you get a lot of low clouds, some fog builds up over places and that. So you can get clear days, but it's not uncommon to have a lot of days where it looks like this. And, and before GPS and some of the fancier stuff, you had to do it all visually when you were flying. So you ended up going underneath it a lot of times. So unless you could see that it was going to be better where you were going. So a lot of times this is sort of what the landscape looked like. And, and that the helicopter had a short range of operations. So they would mark specific lakes for me to drop fuel up for them. They were up and down with their 
uh, researchers all day long doing water sampling, ground sampling, and stuff like that. So they didn't venture too far from where their planned exercises were. So they would mark lakes where I was supposed to go in and drop drums off. Well, a lake looks really nice on a map. It's all blue and everything looks like it's all open water. But when you get there, the lake's all ice covered. So I would have to try and find a small lake or a lake that would be close enough that that had a beach or somewhere decent enough that the helicopter could get in and land so he could fuel. He couldn't start up on the water, so he had have to be on a beach and, and that. And on more than one occasion, I saw the rotor blades clip a few of the willow brushes alongside the beach, but usually I managed to find a spot where I could drop them off and that. I had the benefit of uh, commandeering the cook's helper to give me a hand with hauling the drums and loading them and offloading them into the water, rolling them up to the beaches and stuff like that. So that was a great hand, but uh, we got through. But on occasion, I couldn't find a lake that was close by. Sometimes there'd be a small one and, and I'd circle it several times looking, okay, what are the winds? What's the water depth? Can I get into the beach? Can I get out of there okay? A few of them I took loads in, but I wouldn't take a load out of it and that. But you basically just had to clear the shoreline by a couple of feet that uh, you get airborne. There's no trees or that. And if there's no hills at the end, uh, once you're a few feet in the air, you're okay. And you could cross the shoreline pretty low at the other end as long as the water depths were okay. So that was the main consideration. This is a cairn and repulse bay that marks the Arctic Circle. This was taken in April, this picture right there. And, uh, and this is summer in repulse bay and their fish were a little bit bigger than the ones that we got to supplement our reels. And, and that, so. I'll go back here. So I had one trip that I remember I went into Hall Beach, they were working in the northeast part of the Melville Peninsula. And it was my first time into Hall Beach on a float plane. And I circled around and there was a nice lake beside the airport. And I thought, well, that would be a nice place to land. I can get fuel and stuff hauled down to me. And, and that, but when I called them on the radio, they said, nope, that's forbidden. That's a drinking water lake and you can't go there. Well, there was no other lakes around that were accessible for a vehicle to get to or fuel truck or anything. So I had to land on the ocean. Fortunately, that time, uh, the ocean was glassy water calm and uh, there was a ice covering over most of the ocean that started about a mile out and that which uh, reduced the chance of swells or anything like that. So. I flew over and looked at the beach, and nice beach, big dock, shipping dock, really, not a seaplane dock. So checked it out, but from the air, you could see every stone for a long way out. And I, thought, I don't know whether it's one foot deep or 10 feet deep, it was hard to tell. So, okay, I'll set up, I'll land about a half mile out, and I'll just taxi in and, and see what it's like as I'm going along. So I'm when I did my float endorsement, I did it at Georgian Bay on Lake Huron. And, and the fellow taught me doing glassy water landings, landing out away from any shore or anything like that. So you had no side references, no wheat beds, nothing that you normally use for landing. You set up an attitude and a rate of descent of about 300 feet a minute, and you just do it until you touch the water. Okay, so I sort of started setting that up and, and that and as I came down I noticed there was something floating on the water okay well that's good now I have a reference to where the surface of the water is so I keep going and as I get closer I realize it's a duck and he's swimming along merrily and all of a sudden he hears the airplane and I see the duck's head turn and look at the airplane well then he starts to take off run and he's going full tilt to get airborne and, and that, and I'm still gaining on him. 
and I see his head turn again. And as soon as his head turned again, he hit the water and he cartwheeled several times before coming to a stop on the water. By that time, I was gone past him and, and was touching down myself on the water. So. But that's been the one and only time that I have seen a duck take off and crash on takeoff. So. It was kind of a fun experience to watch. When I went and did another trip one day, I couldn't get into a lake that was close to where the helicopter wanted, but there was another one, a bigger lake, and it had a long stretch that was open, but it was pretty narrow, but there was access to a beach along it that looked like a nice beach from the air. And on a circle over it, it looked like it was a nice deep run up to the beach and and that so okay well planning and getting there getting in there and there was a very strong wind blowing but it was right in along in line with the length of the, the stretch i had to land on so that was okay i got down okay but then as soon as i started the taxi the airplane just kept weather clocking into it it wouldn't turn at all so i ended up putting a lot of power on and that forcing the airplane to go the direction I wanted towards the beach and, and that and I was making pretty good headway with all the power I had on it when all of a sudden I heard crunch and the airplane just spun 270 degrees around and, and that and I reckon I, okay I hit a rock looking out my side window I had 10 or 12 feet of water under me so I couldn't see what I hit on the other side because I was so leaned back with all the power I had to hold on the rudder pedal and, and in the airplane and, and that, but I knew it hit rocks. So once we spun around, we kind of floated free of the water, rock again and headed for shore. Got into shore, we offloaded the drums and that, and then taxi it out, took off. When I got back to our camp, we pulled the top cover off the step compartment, which was the one I figured it hit. And I looked down and, and there was about a half to three quarter inch wide gash, about 10 inches longer. I can look through and see the pebbles on the bottom of the, the riverbed. Okay, this is not good. But I had to do three more trips to drop fuel off for the helicopter so that he could get his work done and get back to camp. So. I did that, uh, the float full of water, added some weight and a tilt to the airplane. But if I went in a crosswind and cross controlled the ailerons and that, the, the wind would help lift that float out. And, and the airplane had lots of power to all three drums and, and a little bit of, well, a fair bit of water in the step compartment float. So did that. Then the next day I went into Repulse Bay and look for somebody to see if they could fix it. We couldn't fix it at camp. Nobody there could fix it. Phone the company that operated it in Toronto and said, okay, this happened and that. They said, well, why don't you fly it to Churchill? And that there's an operator there that can do it and maybe get it fixed. Then you can get back up there as soon as they get it done. And, okay, well, went back to camp. The next day, left early morning for Repulse Bay to pick up fuel and head down to Rankin Inlet and then Churchill's. It was clear in Repulse Bay. It was clear in Rankin Inlet. And I headed down and, you know, oh, this is a nice day, sitting up in the sunshine and, and that. I get there and about halfway down Hudson's Bay at Wager Bay, I started running into fog where there was open water and in Wager Bay and that. This picture is actually of Pond Inlet, the entrance of Pond Inlet, but the fog, you get an idea of how you can be in the clear one minute and then low fog start covering a lot of the area. The area around Wager Bay was more like up in the Melville Peninsula. It was flatter, so there wasn't the mountains or stuff like it shows here. But still, I went pretty low. And I got low enough that at one point there was a big boulder and I flew around below the top of the boulder just as I crested a hill. And uh, the fog only lasted probably about 10 or 15 miles that covered the area that I was transiting. And then I sort of got back into clear and got to Rankin and 
and the lake I had to land on there was about 14 miles out of town, even though calling ahead, it took a while for them to get a truck out there with drums of fuel that I could wobble into the airplane. Once I was fueled, I headed for Churchill, got to Churchill, and that talked to everybody there that would have possibility of fixing the float. Nobody was able to do it. Okay, they suggested I go to Moosonee. They said there's an operator there that could do it. All right, I head off, fuel up, head off. I got to go to Winnes first to fuel, and that's about halfway to Moosonee or so. And, but to get to Winnes, I got to cross Hudson's Bay. I don't have enough fuel to follow the shoreline. So at one point, I'm about 60 miles out over Hudson's Bay. And I'm sitting at 9,000 some feet looking down at 20 foot swells and figure, well, if the engine quits, I just point it straight down. That's it. And I read a book, not to look out the window too often, but get into the way go, okay, fuel, and then it's pretty well I can follow the shore from there. So a flight plan from there to get into Moosonee at a particular time, and, and I'm flying along. And the Hudson's Bay lowland in that area is the swampiest, boggiest section of Canada I think I've ever seen. It's all water, swamp, muskeg, and, and stuff. And I'm going across, it's flat. Meanwhile, you got low cloud and fog start filling. So I'm probably down to almost oh, 600, 500 feet or less with one to three miles visibility crossing it. And as I get closer to Moose and e, I can pick it up on my ADF and the needle comes in. And, okay, I just followed a needle and then my needle started to reverse sense. But at least it pointed still in the right direction I was heading. So I just figured it was still working and pointing at the beacon. So I followed it, but then I forgot that down that far it gets dark. So I'm going along and as I get closer to Moose A, it's getting darker and darker and dusk is settling in. And, and I get to Moose and E a half hour before my flight notification closing time does and get in there and I land on the river tie up at the dock below the hotel and go up to see about getting a room in the hotel and and that and a hotel manager tells me first off you can't park at the dock you can't leave your airplane there overnight all right gives me a, another place i can park it which is about a mile up the river or whatever and but you got to watch because the tide's out so you've got a zigzag pattern up the river, stay in this place for here, and then move over to the other side. But I did get there and, and that. And then I got back to the hotel. Somebody gave me a lift back to the hotel and, and I phoned and closed my flight number and talked to the flight service guy. I says, yeah, we were taking bets on whether you'd get there or have to sit there. Your closing time was half an hour after official darkness had set in. But I worked out okay. I landed right at official darkness, I guess. We got a room at the hotel, which was the TV room. The hotel was otherwise full, but the manager said, we'll set up a cot for you and a bed in a TV room and you can have that. That was great. And the next morning when I went to pay for it, the fella said, well, that'll be $10. That'll just go to the maid who made up the bed and, that, and that, that'll cover all your costs and everything. Oh, great. Well, I couldn't find anybody in Moose and to fix the airplane. So they suggested Timmons. But if I'm going to go to Timmins, which was, you know, an hour and a half, two hours away, I might as well go all the way to Toronto, which was another three hours down. So I went to Timmins, fueled and took it right to Toronto. And that, and it took 11 days to get it fixed before I had to ferry it all the way back up to the Melville Peninsula to finish the contract. But it was an interesting contract and a lot of fun, but a lot of work too. And, and that. So this is a different thing. If it's winter and this is what your airplane looks like as it's getting prepared for flight in the morning, this is the lap of luxury. This was in Sonderstrom, Greenland. It was operated at that time by the United States Air Force. So it had three Herman Nelsons warming up engines in the cabin of the airplane and a ground power unit. So this was 
probably the nicest I've ever started a twin otter in the morning. Or the, the cover of the book shows a dew line station on the ice cap in Greenland. And this is what it looks like from a distance. There's nothing, we flew over 200 miles of ice, which we did on radar vectors because there's no other way to map read or that. So we got vectored right to it. And that's sort of the picture I used for the cover of the book. That was Die 3, Dew Line Station, also known as Sob Story. And uh, it was 30 below zero. Uh, 30 knot wind blowing that day, and there was about a hundred steps up into the station. And it's sitting on over 8,000 feet of ice. So we're high altitude and that. And by the time I got climbed up to get ready to enter the door of the dew line station, somebody almost had to grab me and drag me and I was worn right out thinner air and, and all the parkas and stuff on climbing the steps. When we got back from doing a week in Greenland servicing dew line stations, we had a trip to do out of Clyde River on Baffin Island. And the trip involved hauling 80 fuel drums into Generator Lake, which was about 100 miles from Clyde River. And it sits at the edge of the Barnes ice cap and the, the slide is of the Barnes ice cap at the edge. The, where it's broken off there, it's about a hundred feet high as you fly along it. There was a Clonset hut there and, and we took glaciologists in there the first trip. And that they were looking for the Quonset hut. Well, all that stuck up was a little bit of the roof and a little flagpole. The rest of it was buried in the snow. So we landed, dropped them off with a few shovels, and they had to go shovel a Quonset hut out. Uh, we went back to load the drums. Well, 80 drums of fuel doesn't sound like a big deal to haul, except there was no way to load them on the airplane. There was no ramp, no equipment, nothing. We had to hand lift each one by ourselves, 450 pounds roughly a piece, lift it up high enough that the edge of the drum would catch the floor of the airplane, lift it up, slide it in, climb aboard, straighten it up, stack it, and go back and do the next one. So it took a lot longer to to do than we had anticipated and, and that, but that's the way it goes. So this was Easter weekend that year. When we got back, I was supposed to head south and now uh, we were supposed to fly to Frobisher after we'd finished our last haul. So we got called them up on the way in, got the weather from Frobisher. Well, big blizzard had moved in there and it was heading towards Fly River. So well, we can't go there, so, okay, we'll have to spend the night. Well, by the time we'd buttoned up the airplane and put the engine tents on and everything, the blizzard had hit Clyde River and we couldn't see to get to the hamlet. So we spent with the time at the radio operator's shop, except this blizzard lasted three days. And it blew strong enough that I went out one time to go to the air terminal building, which was about 15, 20 feet away. And there was a rope connecting the two of them that you had to hang on to. But I opened the door and took a step out and I couldn't see my knees in the blowing snow. Took one more step and walked into a six foot high drift. So I just turned around and went back in the shack. Well, when the storm had stopped on the fourth day, this is not our airplane. This is the RCMP airplane. He was parked a little ways away from us. And that and the snow was up over his nose and down along the windows. Our airplane had snow packed up the whole length of the wing out and that. And Arctic snow is kind of like cement. You can walk on top of it. And that. There was no equipment there to move any snow. So we had to do it all by hand shovels. And 
two of us, it took us nine hours to dig the airplane out. The engine cowls, even with the tents on, were packed full of snow when you dropped the cowl down. The cabin inside, snow had come in through the little gas bars, air vents, even though they were all closed inside the cabin and that. So we eventually did get it out, but boy, it was a lot of hard work and uh, not the way you want to spend Easter weekend. My wife had planned a party for me when I got home, but I never did make it. She said it was a great party though. So. A few years later, I was with transport back in Clyde River again, and we had a flat tire. Okay. Call maintenance in Winnipeg, and they say, well, call Ottawa. Well, we call maintenance in Ottawa. Okay, well, we will send a wheel and tire up to you. We'll get an engineer to come in and, and change it for you, and it'll take three days to get there. All right. So once again, I'm stuck in Glide River, go to the hotel, and again, we get another blizzard well in there. So, okay, not so bad as the first one. This one, snow packed, but we can dig this one out. Not so bad, it's only a foot, foot and a half deep in places. So dig it all out, get ready. Daylight is from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. basically at that time of year. And the engineer is supposed to fly in on the 10 a.m. flight. Well, the 10 a.m. flight doesn't arrive. It arrives at 2 p.m. Okay, it's getting dark again now. And again, it's minus 30, 30 knot wind blowing. So the engineer gets off. He's got the wheel. And we go over to the airplane, jack it up. Okay. And then undoes all the stuff and we start pulling on the wheel. It doesn't budge a quarter of an inch. It's supposed to slide off. This is supposed to be a 15, 20 minute job. That doesn't work. So the engineer goes in, searches the air terminal building, comes out with a <clears throat> hammer and some blocks of wood and starts pounding on the wheel. Well, it took us over two hours to get that wheel off. We'd work on it for about 15 minutes at a time till our hands and everything got so cold you couldn't work anymore. Go in, warm up for 15 minutes or so, then go back out. Eventually we got it fixed. And again, we were supposed to head to Frobisher Bay. Call the weather, get a briefing. Oh, a big system of lizards again is moving through Frobisher Bay and it's heading towards Clyde River. Like, we don't need this again. I mean, it's been fine sitting around the hotel room in the lobby in our underwear for three days, but really don't need to do that. So my partner and I discuss it and we'll say, okay, we'll head to Rankin Inlet for tonight, an 800 mile flight. So after being at the airport at 8.30 in the morning, digging the airplane out and everything at about, five o'clock, six o'clock or whatever it is, we say, we'll get airborne and call up, we'll go to Hall Beach and refuel. And then we'll continue on to Rankin Inlet. So we do that, we get to Hall Beach and it's minus 40 degrees in Hall Beach. They don't have a ground power unit. We had a weak battery and the fuel truck is in the shed. The fueler can't get the fuel truck going. He's trying to use several batteries to jump start it, not working. So I'm talking to him. He says, I got another truck in town. So he goes into town. It's 30 minutes later. He's back out there with this brand new truck and he's going to try and jump the battery in the truck inside the shed with that one. His jumper cables don't reach. So, okay. Um, he'll try and get it a little bit closer. He jumps in, moves it a bit closer, except he smashes the fender into the side of the garage and smashes it all in. But the jumper cable still don't reach, so. Okay, I ask him, do you have an Arctic diesel truck in, in there because we can use that? And, oh, yeah, but it'll be 40 minutes before he can get back with that. So, okay. Meanwhile, my partner's sitting in the airplane with one engine running and uh, 
and I offered to switch with him. He says, no, that's fine. He's bundled up good. And, All right. So we wait. And he, eventually, the guy shows back up at the airport with his Arctic diesel truck, and we refuel and then get airborne again and head for Rankin Inlet. So a nice clear night, stars out and everything. And we arrive in Rankin Inlet at 1 a.m. in the morning. Taxis aren't running. I call a cook at the hotel and he's going to go open the hotel up for us. And one of the flight service station guys is just getting off duty. So he gives us a ride into town. And, and that, so after we had the airplane buttoned up, we head to town and, and not go to the hotel. But we're back out at the airport, 8.30 in the morning, again, getting the airplane ready to go. And, and we get it back to Winnipeg that, that day. So that was okay. It was back home. But my adventures in Clyde River are mem memorable in ways that I don't like to remember them all about. My fingers have been frozen enough. This is a single order I flew for Plumber's Lodge for a few summers. And it's got a great big tail on it. And it has a thousand horsepower Pizzatel engine with a four bladed prop, which was fun to fly, but that tail creates all sorts of hassles. And this is a picture I took on Great Slave Lake, which was where I was based most of the time when I flew it. That a few times I flew it out of Great Bear on trips and stuff like that. But, uh, this just gives you an idea of the, the size of the airplane and the size of the tail and everything. This was a shore lunch spot we flew to frequently on Great Slave Lake. So I was headed up at Great Bear one day and I had a trip to go to the Coppermine River to drop a couple of fishermen off at the camp that Plumbers had there. And, and then continue on to Kugluk Tuck and then on to the Tree River, spend the night at Tree River, bringing a few fishermen back the next day to Great Bear Lake. And so this is a picture of the Tree River showing basically how fast the water is. The Copper Mine River looks very similar to this one. Low flung clay cliffs and, and that was fast water. That gives you an idea how fast the water is in places. And I always figured if you fell in, you'd be 12 miles out in the ocean before you'd slow down. That. But, so I took off for the copper mine. And I'd never been there before, but one of the other pilots had marked the spot where the camp was and briefed me on a couple of rocks in the river to watch for on landing and, and stuff like that. So went over, flew overhead, got down, landed OK, and, and that. But the winds were blowing again across the river at a really high rate. I saw the guide on the shoreline. There was a little spot about 15 feet, 20 feet wide with a little sandy area between the rocks where he was directing me to taxi into. And, and that wasn't a problem. I was taxiing into the wind and, and that. Got in there okay, dropped the fisherman off. And, but then we had to turn the airplane around and, and the guide, he had waders on, so he waded it out and I grabbed the, the rope and eventually swung the tail over the shoreline and, and that, and I said, okay, hang on to it. The Pizzatel engine at that time took 20 shots of prime to start it. Wouldn't start with 18, it took 20 shots and not to get it going. So I started priming, run up, float, jump in, start priming the airplane. Okay, I'm about halfway through the prime when he lets go of the tail of the airplane and the wind immediately weather cocks the airplane into the wind again. Now I'm pointed at the shore and 20 feet out drifting along in the current. And there's a full set of rapids about a half mile away and I'm drifting towards it at a pretty good rate. But I can't start the airplane because if I get it started, I'm up on the rocks on shore right away. So I'm drifting down and, and that white water is getting closer and closer and closer. And uh, eventually I pass a boulder in the river and the current takes a break. And that allows me to kick the rudder enough that the airplane straightens out. And I'd been priming 
sort of along the way and and that uh, but i went down further and i passed the first rock in the white water when the engine finally started i had envisioned coming out the far end of the rapids in a ball of metal and and the guy he jumped in his jet boat and was roaring down but i don't know what good he would have done but the engine started and i put enough power on to get back past the rock in the white water and back where I could take off. So my adventures in the copper mine ended and that and I continued on to cook a truck, piece of cake, drop the package off and move on to the Tree River. So that's Father's camp on the Tree River. And basically I land oh, probably two miles south of there on a stretch of river in between there's a longer straight stretch and, and that between the bends and twists where it's smooth enough to land and then it's about a mile taxi up the river to where they have a dock and that and then it's about a mile boat ride up to the camp and stuff so the river is known for its arctic char fishing and that and a lot of fishermen go there so this is my dockage point on the tree river you can tell by the riffles on the water that it's still fast current there but it's it's an opener and stretch and, and that, my dock that i am tied to is a sheet of plywood with a little piece of plywood going up to the clay bank there and, and uh, it's nothing to really tie to they have some rebar pounded into the bank along the shoreline there so that's what i tied to but again the severe winds were blowing across the river. So tying to the three pieces of rebar just didn't feel comfortable enough and not to leave the airplane. So there was a hay wagon, you can see it sort of behind the tractor there. And we repositioned the hay wagon down closer to the airplane and I run extra ropes that I had in the back of the airplane up and tied it to the hay wagon and that and we figured okay we got three to rebar and three ropes to the hay wagon and that that should be good so we head for camp for the night so earlier in the morning before the guests were ready to fly out I went down to the airplane with a guide to start getting the airplane ready to go but we turned the bend in the river and there's the airplane. It's nosed into the shore, the tail's out, pointed out towards the middle of the river. And the airplane's about 10 feet out from the bank. The dock is torn clean free of the bank. And the hay wagon has been pulled down over the bank into the edge of the river, about two or three feet from the propeller. And that, uh, but never touched the airplane, fortunately. And that, so, okay, we look at it. The guide drops me off and he heads back to camp to get a couple more guides to come down to give us a hand trying to reposition the airplane along the, the shore. So, the guides come and there's a couple of guides out in the boat and they grab the tail rope on the airplane at the tail and they start pulling it in towards the shore. Meanwhile, uh, the one guide and myself are pulling on the, the rear rope on the float and gradually the airplane's tail is coming in and it's just about lined up with the shoreline when the fellows in the boat let go of the rope. Well, then the wind immediately weathercocks the airplane again and the guide hanging on to the float rope, he sails off the shoreline in midair and hits the water. And a stream of profanity came out of him yelling at the other guides and stuff like that. So eventually they came back, we got it back and tied it up and that, so it was secure again along the shoreline. The guests came down, we loaded the guests, fly back to Great Bear Lake and did all the ropes, ready to go, started the airplane up, it wouldn't move. 
it's grounded in the clay on the bottom of the river. So you had to offload everybody again, put more power on, eventually it floats, broke free of the clay on the bottom. And then I positioned the airplane out in the middle of the river. So it took about 2000 RPM just to hold it still in the river. And that. they signaled the guides to bring the guests out and put them on the float and load them that way. And that, which was fine and dandy. And by that time I wasn't in the best of humor. And one of the last fellows to come alongside says, he can't swim. I kind of just looked out the door. I said, well, don't fucking fall in there. Eventually he got on the float and got in the airplane. We got back to Great Bear, okay. So those are the kind of experiences you can have with a single otter. And if you've flown one, I'm sure you've had issues with wind at one point or another and weather caught. This is what's flying over open water or ice covered water at different times on the ocean or that looks like. We used to do trips out of Frobisher Bay to a place called Port Burwell. And uh, Port Burwell was a little small community at the tip of the Northwest Territories, Labrador and Quebec borders where they met, it was located on an island. And we fly down the length of Frobisher Bay and then cross about a hundred miles of ocean. The, way we found it most times was the radio operator that was based there would go up on his hill and transmit for five minutes every so often so our ADF needle could home in on his station. But we usually were pretty low because of these type of clouds and that so we often didn't pick it up till we were about 30 miles out or so. Meanwhile you've been looking for an island and and every open patch of water in the ice looks dark and looks like an island from a distance and low down. And you zigzag down there until finally you see your needle swing and, and then you can go there. Well, this is Port Burwell. Little community, uh, bottom of a cliff behind it. And you can see in the right photo, the shadow of a cliff on the opposite side. And there's an ice strip that flows along the shoreline just past where it's all crinkled up there and that on the right side. So we went there on a medevac one day and the wind were blowing severely across the, the river or the ice strip and, and that. And we were on skis, wheel skis, skis were down and we come in and we touch down and we go along a few feet and then all of a sudden the airplane weather cocks into wind. So now we're going sideways down this air ice strip and, and that and I'm looking out the window waiting for the gear leg to collapse or that. The airplane miraculously stayed pretty well on the center line of the runway until it came to a stop. And that, but it was a nerve wracking experience. So much so that when we got back to Frobisher Bay, the gap that I was with, when he raised his skis, he'd set the parking brake when the skis were down. And, and when we came in, he says, we'll do a short field landing, make the first turn off. And that, well, we did a really short field landing because he forgot to release the parking brake on the check before landing. And, and uh, so the flight service guy said, congratulations on doing a really good landing. And the engineer, that was at our base was not so happy when he saw the black streaks on the runway. And uh, on another occasion with a different captain went there again, again, severe winds and that blown across the ice strip. This time the fellow I was with decides, well, we'll land going across this ice strip. All right, there's about a quarter mile between the cliffs and that coming down this hillside. So we started down and it was rough. We rolled and rocked and everything and bounced and, and that, but we got down and we did get stopped before we basically got across the ice strip looking at this wall of rock in front of it, kind of a spooky experience. When we got back to Frobisher Bay, the nurse 
refused to ever fly with us again. I sat in Trobisher Bay with the captain and engineer one time and we're listening on the radio and we heard this Lake Buccaneer story that it being flown across the Arctic and, and that on the radio and we thought, gee, that's kind of strange. Why would anybody want to fly something like that across the Arctic in, in the winter and, and that? And apparently it was owned by some missionaries and it was being ferried to the Philippines. So, okay, that's fine. Two days later, we heard that it had crashed on the Davis Strait, 75 miles off Cape Dyer. And that, and Greenland Air had gone out the next day and picked up the people that were on the airplane. They were unhurt. And we'd sat around thinking, okay, well, I, we hope they put it down before the engine blew, our engineer had an idea of what likely was the problem that the oil breather tube had been sticking out of the cowling and not gone off and probably froze up and pressure built up. And, and that and we hoped that it put it down before they noticed, you know, that the engine was actually blowing apart. So we thought, well, this is an in international water. If you go and get the airplane, maybe we can even fly it out the middle. So I don't mind sitting around with nothing to do for days on end. Well, let's take our twin otter and go out there. So, all right, we did. We ordered some three drums of fuel on and, and some oil and other stuff equipment for the engineer, and we headed out there. We got vectored to the last known position of the airplane by a Cape Dyer Blue Line station and, and that, but we still flew patterns back and forth for an hour and we were just getting ready to head back to Frobisher when we spotted the airplane on the ice. Okay, we'll go down and land beside it. There was, a, there was enough stretch where we could get in and that. So. We went down and the first thing we did is jump out with a power arm and to test the thickness of the ice. And, and that, and I was told that we need 24 inches of ice, sea ice to, to hold the twin auger. When we augered through, we were through in about 16 inches. And the captain, he said, well, I just want to sit in the airplane with the engines at high idle for 15 minutes or so, watching the ice to see if anything happens. And, the engineer and I get out and, and the first thing I do is, okay, I roll a drum of fuel off to get ready to wobble back into the airplane. And the first drum is a light drum. So when I kick it out, it bursts in half, it splits and runs all over the ice. It's not really great, but I'm not gonna do about it at that point. Next two drums are heavier, so they're fine. And I get those into the thing. Then we head over to the airplane. Again, another typical day, minus 30 with a 30 knot wind blowing out there. And that we work, strip off what parts we can because the engine's cracked and down the block. And, and that the airplane still had the price tag and it was a brand new airplane. Price tags at 55,000 US dollars. Strip radios out of it and whatever else we can get out to or two frozen and not to, to do much more. And, and then get back in our airplane. There was a woman and a young lad flying it. Their suitcases were filled with summer gear, shorts and t-shirts and stuff. They had no winter survival gear at all on board. They were fortunate a Nordair DC-3 had flown across after they had put the airplane down and it dumped all their survival gear out to them on the flyover. So they were able to survive it the night till Greenland air got out to them. And probably a few days after we were there, I expect the airplane would have gone through the ice and to the bottom of the ocean. This is a twin otter I flew a summer out of Thompson and, and we had a contract out of Island Lake to haul supplies to base stores 
at Wasagamac and Red Tucker Lake. So, okay. Lammers C-46 would haul the supplies down and that, and then we'd, we would take them in the float plane and, and drop them off. But there was a problem. The C-46 hauled 12,000 pounds of freight. We could haul 3,000 a load. And there was another problem on the contract. There was no fuel available for us at the dock. So we had to get the C-46 to haul fuel down for us too, and then get it from the airport down to the dock for us to use. So that was okay. Problem number three arose is that there was no inside storage for the freight the C-46 was hauling. And that period of time, it happened to be raining just about all day long, most of the time. So all the freight that was dropped at the airport sat out in the open and, and got thoroughly soaked. So we would have it hauled down to us in the back of a pickup truck and we would load on the airplane. Well, we had about three or 4,000 pounds of pop cans to load and every carton was soaking wet and soggy and just fell apart when you tried to load them on board. So basically what we had on board was just a great big pile of pop cans sitting loose in the airplane. And, and part of the contract they bit, I couldn't figure out because Wasagamac was eight miles away from Garden Hill where we were operating. And there was a barge that could haul 36,000 pounds of load, so they could have hauled it on the barge, but no, we had to fly it there. So we barely had time for the batteries to recharge after takeoff where we were landing. But I remember hauling this load of pop cans into the fella, and I said, you know, like, if you don't want to take it, I will just keep it and haul it back. I said, I wouldn't accept it this way. And that. he said, no, no, that's fine. So we offloaded them all with a fish net onto the dock. And then the poor guys had to load them all in their truck for, with loose hands and stuff like that. So that was one experience in Island Lake on that contract. And this was a Northern Terra Twin Otter in their original paint scheme. I flew for a while. And that, but this one night, I was senior base pilot in Thunder Bay, and, and that, and I got a phone call, and, and that saying, could I use a twin otter for a medevac flight out of Terra Bay, which is about halfway down the North Shore of Lake Superior to the east? And I said, well, we're not authorized to do that type of work. We're a commuter service on contract with the government of Ontario who owns the airplanes. Had that, but they said, well, there's four stretcher cases. There's been a bad accident. They need to get them to hospital. Okay, this was at 8, 8 p.m. I got the call and, and I said, well, okay, I'll get hold of a co-pilot and get over this here. And there's a big storm system moving in across the area. And it hadn't reached Thunder Bay at that time. I called the weather office and got a briefing from them. And that, my co-pilot met me out there. We were at the airport at 8.15. We checked the weather, got the airplane, pulled out of the hangar, got it ready and that. And then I called air traffic control. I said, what are you showing on your radar? And that, you know, these big storms moving in. And the fellow told me, well, if you get airborne within 15 minutes, you should be ahead of the storm system in that. So, all right, we jump in the airplane, get ready to go. And this was at 8.45, I talked to him. And by 9 p.m., we were rolling down the runway and we got airborne. The first thing you realize when we got airborne is they lied. The storm system was already past us in that. And that. Uh, and we didn't have a radar in this airplane, but we were flying and there was enough lightning lighting up the clouds that we had to put sunglasses on to fly. The air was still smooth and we picked our way between thunder clouds that were huge by the lightning. The lightning would flash light up the cloud like a light bulb in a dark room. 
and then we would see the dark gaps and head to them and, and we'd pick our way around clouds that way and and the air stayed smooth where we were flying it, it was very unusual so we get out of ways and and we're approaching closer to terrace bay when we get a call and that and it says terrace bay airport is closed due to a big storm okay and and we're about there and, and we're near wawa and we hear a guy talking to air traffic control he's flying a nord air 737 and he's diverted 137 miles south of wawa to avoid the storm system and he's at 37,000 feet and we're going along and we look down at our dme that's on Wawa, and we're 11 miles from Wawa. Oh, this is not real good. And that, okay, we can't get to Terrace Bay. We'll head to Sault Ste. Marie and hopefully we get out of the storm system before we go too far. We got out of the storm system at 20 miles to the west of Sault Ste. Marie. And that got on approach to land. And, and then the tower guy says, keep your speed up. I got an Air Canada jet behind you coming in to land. Okay, so I do 160 knots right to almost short final and, and then bring the power back and, and that land on the runway and get down. And by that time, it's about 11.30 to almost midnight. I had a friend that lived in Sault Ste. Marie, so I phoned him up and said, you know, can you come out and pick stuff at the airport? And that, so he took us back to his house where we slept on the floor, but we drank all his rum before we did that and stuff. But one of the things we had on route that was the one and only time I've ever seen it is St. Elmo's fire. And it was green. We had green eastern flames coming off the propellers and the wings going back behind the airplane. And it was mesmerizing to watch. It's harmless. It's just static. But... Uh, it was really fascinating, but it's been the only one and only time in all my career that I have seen that. And our trip really wasn't over then because we had to ferry the airplane back to Thunder Bay the next morning. And while we were out refueling the airplane and the fuel bowsers beside us, there's one fellow, he's about a hundred yards away from us. He's hand propping an airplane. And there's nobody in the cockpit of his airplane. And I'm thinking, okay, if that starts and it starts running all over the airport, I know which direction I'm running. And and that, and sure enough, the airplane engine started on them and the brakes weren't set and the airplane started running all over the ramp. But fortunately, it ran the opposite direction and we were, I think it took him about 200 feet to catch up with it and jump into the cockpit before he managed to stop it. And, and that's so there's another single lighter I flew out of Thompson and, and one that I didn't mind flying, but it tried to do a few things to me that really didn't make me happy sometimes. And the first one I did was a flight at 40 below zero and the janitorial heater quit shortly after takeoff and I had three hours. I'm sitting in that cockpit without any heat before I got the Thompson to come in to land and, and I was cold enough it took me two hands to turn the little toggle switch on for the booster pump to come in to land with it. And then I did another flight with it and I was 135 miles north of Churchill in it. And I was doing a fuel drop for an exploration company. And nobody knows basically where you go, except maybe one or two people because the exploration company didn't want anybody to know where these drops were, where they were working. So, okay, I did my fuel drop on the lake that I was supposed to run, and then took off to come back into Churchill. And, and I was part way back into Churchill when all of a sudden I got smoke pouring in between my feet and, up into the cockpit and I'm trying to figure okay I look all the engine instruments are showing green and the airplane's still running okay but there's more smoke coming in and there used to be a thing if you opened one in 
window six inches and the other one open, it meant that all the smoke would go to one side. And that was about as useless as anything. I ended up opening both windows as far as they would open and, and that and smoke still came up. And, and I didn't know what was going on, but I took the fire extinguisher and kind of put it between my knees and, and flew low over the lakes and but everything was still operating. Okay, temperatures were normal and, and that. So as long as the engine was going, I figured if I sat down in the lake, it'd be three or four days before anybody would find me. So I kept going and then I tried reaching anybody on a radio, couldn't reach anybody at all. So chugged along, zigzagging a couple hundred feet, figuring the flames started to come up and then I could stick it on the water and jump out as fast as I could. And that, so I think I finally got in contact with somebody about 35 miles out of Churchill and, and that flew around Button Bay and and landed on the lake at the end of the airport that we used. And the engineer came down to meet me and, and his eyes got wider as he got closer to the airplane. And when I stepped out, I could see the paint was burned off the cowling in a three foot diameter circle. And I said, okay. He pulled the cowling down later and he says the engine exhaust stacks had blown off the engine on one side and that, and that was the cause of it. So, but it was a disconcerting flight all the way. And at one other time in the winter when I went to start that airplane, it caught fire on start. And that and I had flames climbing up over the cowling, not climbing up over the windscreen. And fortunately, the setting the engine down and using the system fire extinguisher put the fire out and some people weren't happy I put it out because they said the insurance was the worst part than the airplane was but for me it was to get out and that and using the system extinguisher it seemed to suck all the oxygen out of the cockpit when it put the fire out so that was three incidents I've had with that airplane and uh, so. this is another Northern Terror Twin Otter I flew and that, that's the ladder paint screen and that. And for the most part, their operation was really good and we had no problems. I flew them for seven years out of Thunder Bay with, first of all, on air operating the contract and then Bearskin Lake Airways operating the contract. And, and uh, but one time I did a flight from Dryden into Kenora on one. And when we landed, we were taxiing up the runway and the one propeller feathered without touching any other controls. Okay, this was December 15th at night. Landed, taxied in, offloaded people. Some were getting off in Kenora, some were going through to Red Lake. Called our maintenance base and that, and they said, well, they have to fly an engineer up to take a look at it and that so range with the ticket agent we had to bust the people to red lake and, and that we waited for the engineer to arrive which took a couple of hours and, and that and then he went out and dropped the cowling started working on the engines and we kind of just sort of hung around and finally he buttoned it up and and he gone over everything and changed a couple of switches or that so that was fine okay so we get it all done next morning we got to ferry it back we go out start it up go through every check that's possible to go through move it to the spot on the ramp where we're not going to affect anybody do high speed run up checks everything everything is working fine just to be careful I pull the circuit breakers for the beta system and the propeller auto feather system just in case any of those are a factor taxi out to the end of the runway just the other pilot and myself and the engineer we had he's sitting in the front seat basically looking at the instrument panel fly power take off go down the runway 
hold it on, everything's good, get airborne, climb through 200 feet, both propellers feather simultaneously. And it slowed the airplane fast enough, I went forward against the shoulder harnesses. At the same time, my hands up and slamming both power levers forward. Not sure what the heck was going on at that time. And that, then I look, as I start to retard the power levers, look down and the torques are descending through 55 pounds of torque. The maximum torque for big up was 50 pounds. So when they went into feather, they surge up higher and my pushing power levers aggravated that. Pull it back, but as soon as they got it in the full feather a bit, it started to unwind. But while it's in feather, there's a barn. I'm looking at, can I clear the barn at the end of the runway? There's a pond behind the barn. Can I put the airplane onto the pond? Is the ice thick enough to hold the airplane? And if it's not, can I get it close enough to shore that we can get out and survive? And that. So when the props started coming out of feather, that's fine. We continued to climb. I manually shut down the one engine that I'd had the propeller feather on the night before and get rid of that side. And when I reached 1,000 feet and that, I was basically at circuit height and, and was headed back towards the runway. And that good engine that I was operating on, the propeller feathered twice more while I was in in the circuit basically to land, but it would feather and unfeather pretty well simultaneously. So when I got down and that, we went in and, and that, and they sent another airplane to pick us up so we could fly the next day. So that was my adventures. Originally the Haviland and everybody said, you didn't have a double to propeller feather. It's impossible. I said, I was there. I had both propellers feathered. But three years later, they finally came and say, okay, it did happen. It happened. The co-pilot had reached up and turned the prop DI switch on. <clears throat> and there were three wires behind the seat clamp that were frayed. And when he turned that switch on, it shorted the wires out. And that would cause the feathering. Then the vibrations of the airplane and the engines would separate the wires and that would cause the unfeathering again. And they told me that if you'd have just turned the master switch off, then you would have been fine. You would have eliminated that. But that took them three years. They had to look at it. I had just a couple of seconds trying to figure out. And it surprised me how much you can think of through two seconds when something critical like that is happening. This was an airplane that I flew for well over a thousand hours, I think. But this happened a few years after I'd left Moon Run Terror. And I think the pilot flying was trying to demonstrate a short field takeoff to the co pilot, but one that used 30 degrees of flap instead of 20. And I've been trained when I flew with Bradley's in the Arctic that you can use 30 degrees of flap for takeoff, but it's a soft field takeoff. It's not the short field takeoff. So it's mainly to get your wheels off the ground as soon as possible. And then you just lower the nose while you build up airspeed and retard the flap so you can get climb speed and climb flap steady. This is what it looks like when you don't do it right. When I was with transport, I got a little task assigned to me one time to go and look into what's required to authorize a rocket launch. I worked in the Air Navigation System Directorate. And unbeknownst to me at the time, there was an air regulation that said the Director of Air Navigation shall authorize rocket launches in Canada. Okay. So this crossed my desk and says, look into this. So there's a company in Winnipeg called Actuate Aerospace that wanted to launch rockets at a surface. Use the old spaceport that had been used when they launched rockets to study the Aurora Borealis. Their intent was to use Russian start rockets, which were mobile rockets <clears throat> that could be moved and, and put communication satellites on to launch from low Earth orbits. 
So I started looking into this. And the first thing I did was, okay, I'll Google and see what I can pull up on that. And somebody said, well, check in the United Nations treaties. And uh, so I did that. And then I found out Canada was signatory to seven United Nations treaties that govern rocket launches and space operations. So, okay, I downloaded these and started reading. Well, this was not like reading. And I really didn't have any background in space operations or anything. So I started looking into it, got more involved and more involved every day. Then they sent me on the basic space indoctrination course for the military. I took that and got kicked out of the top secret classes, but covered most of the stuff anyway. And, and then I took specialized courses down in the US that were set up uh, for some NASA engineers and stuff like that. And, on rocket operations, pyrotechnics, and that. And we hired consultants in Cocoa Beach, Florida, that uh, were range safety specialists and, and that. So they set up courses for me and I went down there and took those. And, and part of the fun part was this image here is a, the last scout rocket launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, my boss and myself went down there and to watch it get launched, but it got canceled when we were there. So this happened later and the photo was from Don Forney and, and he worked on the scout operations. Uh, along with Werner von Braun for a while when he came across from Germany after World War II and stuff. So this was the last scout rocket launch. This is, I did get the tour of Cape Canaveral and even be there on top of the range control center for a Delta II launch stuff. And that Cape Canaveral is the military side of the, the launch facility down there. Cape Kennedy is a civilian site. So this was actually the shuttle launch pad and, and that the water tower to the right dumps a whole pile of water on it. And that's to reduce vibration so it doesn't break apart during launch. This is a picture taking underneath the shuttle. And the fellow is replacing tiles on the heat shield of the shuttle. Each tile is a unique shape, size, thickness. And that you can hold a welding torch to a tile and take the torch away, and you can pick up the tile with your bare fingers dissipate heat that well. I have no idea what they're made of or that, but I didn't get to see the shuttle close up. This was the rocket launch tower at Churchill Spaceport that remained from the earlier launches, but this was the one last used in the 1990s for the last rocket, which was a Black Brent 9 rocket that was launched. And that This is the Black Brand 9. The first stage is the white one, held 2,500 pounds of solid propellant. And that's the propellant inside. Solid propellant burns really fast, creates a high specific impulse so it can lift a load fast. That's why the shuttle had two solid propellant boosters outside its main liquid fuel source. And the red one is the second stage. This white one here, the 2,500 pounds burned off in four and a half seconds. So one of the things with solid propellant is you can shoot a bullet into it and nothing will happen. But if you get electric spark jump from your finger to it, you will be vaporized. So in some of the big rockets, you wear Static clothing, static straps, they're on static grounding, everything. And uh, they're very cautious, plus they also have seven foot thick walls reinforced with steel to contain the blast. You leave your ID card outside so they know who is inside because there's nothing left. This was the last twin otter I flew. This was taken in Greece, New York. Uh, it was way back in the 2008 or something. And this was a good view that they put up and, and that. So 
if you needed a good place to sit while you absorbed the view, you could do it. And that's it. So if you're interested in my book, you can email me at jiottertails at gmail.com. It's $39.75, including shipping.